I think that's the beauty of what David's done is it, it does so much more justice than other iterations to the actual source material, it's so much more psychological and it's not just focusing on like clashings of swords and things like that, but it's actually about the journey. Hello, this is Deb Patel and this is how I became Sir Gawain for The Green Knight. So Gawain is the young, slightly headstrong and spoiled nephew of King Arthur, and he finds himself sitting with the Knights of the Round Table, but he has no real legacy or real reason to be there. So he's eager to prove himself. You know, he's faced with this challenge to go and face this Green Knight on this very futile task. He goes on this journey and is very quickly stripped of all of his belongings, and he's kind of sort of goes on a trial by nature to kind of face this ominous destiny. I was handed David's script and I was utterly enthralled. They put me in a spell for, you know, weeks after that and I kind of became obsessed with it. The imagery was ingrained in my brain and I was constantly pestering my agents, like, what's happening with that, what's happening with that? I finally got to chat with him and we really hit it off. Try to land a blow against me. Indulge me in this game. I will be there. There's older depictions of Gawain like that are quite chaste and he's very pure and youthful. And there was an allure to this more scrappy version, but uh, there were some really dislikable traits, which I wasn't totally against, but I was just like, you know, me and David were having conversations. It wasn't like anything was drastically changed, but you know, you're on this journey with this guy for a long time. I mean, basically nearly every frame of this thing. So I was like, how can we be with him? Even when he does really questionable things and you're quite frustrated by him in certain moments. And, yeah, so that was this kind of evolving discussion and it's it's David and his prowess as a director to really, you know, kind of taper and temper that journey. You'll find no mercy, no happy end. Why do you stop me? Me too, as I can. I feel bad for David because I kind of was like, yeah, I can learn a horse, that's easy. You know, I'm quite a physically active guy. I found it really hard. They put me on this really cute, very small horse called Sparkles. She's, she's like one of the horses on Vikings. I think one of the, the female characters, you know, rides her. But I got on, I'm six foot two, and my kind of my my feet were kind of scraping on the ground. So it kind of looked a bit like I was sitting on a Shetland pony or something. So they upgraded me to something more robust. And it was this beautiful horse called Armani. He He's a real boisterous uh, personality. And I, I, I'm, you know, I was kind of like drowning in all the armor and stuff anyway, in the costume. So to try and make it look cool was, I don't know. I don't think I quite achieved that, but Armani, I would kind of, I would steal an apple from the lobby of the hotel every day and go and feed him in the mornings. And, and we, we really became tight. We became tight throughout film. It was a really physically kind of taxing shoot in the sense that I was in it and there were long shoot days and short turnovers and it was cold and damp. And in between takes, they were running in and you know throwing a blanket over the horse because the horse was just freezing as well. And it was like, it was a really interesting process, but you know, the environment on set was always so positive. David is such a positive, kind, beautiful individual. So that kind of trickled through all the departments in a way. So as, as dark or as gloomy or as rainy as the days got, you know, he was this kind of constant source of energy and light. Um, but, you know, we went to extreme lengths to achieve some of this imagery. You know, the whole crew was like, you know, select members were tr trudging through rivers and had created these improvised pulley systems to get the camera, you know, equipment up you know, to, you know, really crazy places so we could get these beautiful vistas and it really pays off. Like every frame really is a painting in this, you know, the compositions are just insane. Christ is born. Christ is born indeed. <laughs> Alicia was like a, a dream to work with. She's so supremely talented, it's kind of intimidating. And she has this kind of precision as a performer, which someone like myself, who's kind of all limbs can only dream of, but she's an awesome person and she's juggling these two roles, decided to go with totally different accents for both of them. And it was, it was amazing to work with her. And likewise with Joel, he kind of went down the rabbit hole of watching all of these old, you know, British actors, Oliver Reeds and stuff. And he came to set and was like a totally different person. And he makes it look so effortless. And 
you've got Sean and, and all, also Ralph, who's kind of, you know, in this massive Green Knight, you know, prosthetic piece costume, but his booming voice just totally, you, could, you felt the performance through it, he was amazing. When I first saw Ralph in that makeup, I was, he is terrifying up close and the, the level of detail that went into just all of the kind of roots and, and veins on, on the prosthetics on his hands. There wasn't an inch of real Ralph left. You know, his eyes, they'd put these massive contact lenses in, and, but he's got this voice, you know, that just commands a room and it is like the voice of destiny. And he's such a cool guy. Never did he once ever moan or, you know, uh, he, he was a rock star. We all fear, but fear can be a gift. I am really ambitious and I feel sometimes you lose sight of, of the joy of doing something because you're so caught up in something else or the ambition or the, the end goal. Uh, and th this story kind of takes you through the journey of that. Yeah, there's a beautiful moment in the film. I don't want to give too much away, but you kind of see it. If success was kind of achieved in the wrong way, if it was built on lies and immoral actions, it's a moral lesson in a way of how that would play out and how empty that might feel. That really struck me when I read the script. What do you hope to gain from facing all of this? Honor. I think that's the beauty of what David's done is it, it does so much more justice than other iterations to the actual source material, it's so much more psychological and it's not just focusing on like clashings of swords and things like that, but it's actually about the journey. It is about this man's blinding ambition and to, to be someone great, uh, the pitfalls of that. You know, he's so feeble in a way, he starts off so masculine and boisterous and cocky and then you kind of, he's put through this trial by nature and totally has the confidence battered out of him. But these stories deal with the chivalric code and they, they use loftier words, but it's about truth and integrity. And it's, you know, it's, you know, he's trying to be great but can he maintain being good at the same time? Can he, can he achieve? Should he be striving for goodness instead of greatness? You know, um, these are the questions that this, this story kind of juggles and I think will always be relevant. That is why Knight does what he does. Are you ready?